Good evening. Well, we're about a minute before starting at seven. Good to see a few folks have joined in. We will um, wait a few minutes, or at least we'll wait a minute and then kick off. Well, that's uh, seven o'clock, so welcome tonight to the second virtual public meeting of this election campaign. There is one happening in each of the five parts of the constituency, and tonight's one is for the good people of Badenoch. And uh, yesterday we were in Lochaber and uh, tomorrow it uh, will be somewhere else as well. But the, the questions and the themes and hopefully the audience um, are all centred around the issues that matter to the people of uh, Badenoch and Strathspey, although um, we're more than happy to, to, to welcome people from, from elsewhere in the constituency as well. So thank you very much for uh, giving up your time on a stunning evening uh, with a, a very warm uh, day. My name is Kate Forbes um, and uh, this, as I said, is the second one. So we learned a few things from doing a virtual meeting uh, yesterday. So uh, one of the learnings is to try and keep it um, short, sharp and uh, sweet uh, in terms of going through the various issues. Obviously, normally we would be doing this in a village hall, setting up the chairs and uh, waiting for people to come through the front door. But I think although we can't do that for health reasons, it's really important that we ensure that democracy can continue in these times. And uh, so this is the, the, the virtual equivalent. We have asked for questions in advance. So thanks to those for those who submitted questions. And um, we have got some questions, we've got quite a number of questions actually, that were either submitted or were submitted through the survey cards um, that were uh, issued um, um, a few weeks ago. But if you do have any questions or comments over the course of the next wee while, um, if you want to respond to anything I've said or ask any follow-up questions, then you can post um, a question or a comment in the event a uh, discussion on Facebook. So if you go to the event discussion on Facebook, you'll find a place to put in the details um, and you can uh, respond, uh, you, can, you can ask it um, or comment um, there. I will try and keep this, as I said, um, short, sharp and sweet. Um, and of course, if you feel like um, things haven't been answered uh, and you want to, uh, to continue the conversation afterwards, then feel free to write me an email at any point. Uh, the email address is info at kate-forbes uh, dot scott and I'll reply. So without further ado, it's 7.02 and um, let's kick off. I'll start with um, a few comments about the election and then we'll dive into the questions. I'm sure for, for many of you, the, an election may feel like the last thing on your minds just now as we start to emerge from lockdown, as the restrictions are relaxed and as we reflect on probably one of the most difficult years that we have all faced it collectively. And in the midst of that year, we've all probably seen the huge importance of good leadership. Leadership has never mattered as much as it has over the last few months. And whilst there's lots to be hopeful about just now in terms of the vaccination programme remaining on track, over half of Scotland's population now vaccinated, with that light at the end of the tunnel, now more than ever, we need experience, we need trust, and we need competent leadership in terms of our recovery from COVID. And the recovery of the, the many communities in Badenoch and Strathspey, where it's Abbey Moor, Canusi, Newton Moor, the recovery of our local economies it has got to be an absolute top priority. And it is a top priority for me because the pandemic has left countless businesses on their knees 
I know many of you have been in touch with me. Unemployment has risen and young people are being priced out of housing. And that's a particular issue in the National Park. And my commitment going into this election is to tackle each of those challenges in the same way as I have tackled challenges in uh, Badenoch and Strathspey over the last few years, which is to listen, to be accessible, to understand the concerns that are being raised, to listen first, and then to work with you through the ups and the downs until the problem, problem is fixed. And doing that together over the last few years, we have seen progress. We've seen progress on difficult issues, um, and we've seen progress that's been a long time coming. We've got the new hospital in Aviemore, that that stretch from uh, of the A9 between King Craig and Dalradi is finished. And issues last summer when it came to tourism congestion have also seen significant progress. Today, the SNP published their manifesto. And it's a manifesto for Scotland, but it's a manifesto with particularly important policies in it for the Highlands. There are, are, are um, there's support in place for investing in our economy with a £20 million rural entrepreneur fund, as well as developing uh, tech hubs across the Highlands. There is a commitment to invest in the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund to deal with those issues around congestion and tourism, including funding for seasonal rangers. There's continued support for duelling the A9. And that is the, the, the local stuff. But there's a lot in the manifesto as well, which is important nationally. There is a focus very much on economic recovery. There's a focus on protecting our NHS and establishing a new national care service. There's a focus on providing opportunities for young people so that they don't have to leave the Highlands, but they can choose to live and work here. There's a commitment on tackling climate change and delivering on our very ambitious, uh, legal, statutory climate change ambitions. There's a commitment to end child poverty. And finally, there is a commitment to make Scotland an equal partner, partner with our friends in the rest of the UK and across Europe. So much, I said, hangs on this election. It is one of the most important elections in Scotland's history, but at its very heart is a question. And it's a question about who should decide our country's future. We know that we need experienced leadership, but ultimately we know that Scotland's future and all the choices that Scotland wants to make should be in Scotland's hands and not in the hands of a distant Westminster government. And that is what is at the heart of this election. It's about who gets to decide Scotland's future. And this election can be the one in which Scotland overwhelmingly and decisively shows that it is choosing a better path for all of our futures, whether it's people in, uh, in Badenoch communities, people uh, further north in Caithness and Sutherland, or people on the west of this constituency in Skye. It means our communities, our people, the people of Scotland, having the right to decide their future in an independence referendum. And with independence, we'll have a recovery that is made in Scotland and we'll have the powers needed to build a fairer and more prosperous country as well. And that's why, as I come to a, a close in these first few minutes, this election focuses, yes, on the local issues that need to be resolved. It focuses, yes, on the need to have competent leadership as we navigate the next few years. But ultimately, it is also about ensuring that it's the people of Scotland that gets to decide and it's not uh, distant governments elsewhere. And that is why this election is so important. Well, we have got a number of questions um, uh, that have been sent in and they're grouped in terms of different themes. So we get through it. Somebody else has grouped them. Somebody else has been managing uh, the questions. So some of these will be a surprise to me, but they have been grouped into economy infrastructure, uh, into tourism, uh, housing, health and environment. And again, if you've got any questions or comments, just fire in a, a fire in a, a question or a comment to the events page on the Facebook group, and I will respond to that. So um, we'll dive uh, right in to these questions. And the first question is perhaps uh, one that um, is the most 
one of the most important issues um, right now. It's been one of the most important issues through the pandemic, and it's certainly going to be one of the most important issues as we come out, which is help for small businesses. How will you uh, ensure that small businesses continue to get help as we emerge from the pandemic? The first answer to that is that small businesses do need help. Of that, there is no doubt. I'm not sure. I, I think I've lost count of the number of businesses, small and medium sized, that have been in touch with me during the pandemic since last February. It sometimes feels like every business has been in touch. And I know that businesses are pretty much through their reserves if they're not through their reserves already. They've had the enormous trauma and distress of sometimes managing staff and ultimately trying to navigate the many changes to the rules um, when it comes to how they can trade, when they can trade, and what regulations they need to abide by. I think that the two answers to that question are uh, financial support and emerging from lockdown. Because ultimately, I know that no amount of financial support, no amount of grant support will ever compensate for the ability to trade and ultimately, it's just sticking plasters compared with the ability to trade. It doesn't cover fixed costs and it doesn't compensate for lost income. And so the first priority is trying to get small businesses open and trading as quickly as possible. Now, we have set out the route map. The next key date is the 26th of April, when the vast majority of hospitality businesses, as well as the vast majority of non-essential retail will be able to open. We also know from this Friday that people will be allowed to travel across Scotland and from the 26th they'll be allowed to travel across the UK, well from England and Wales with Northern Ireland still to be reviewed and that means that our tourism businesses particularly can expect um, to have more customers um, as we reopen. So the first answer is about helping small businesses through reopening. Now sometimes people ask why we um, are, are pitting the, 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 co the health issues against the economic issues. But actually, in order to get the economy back up and running, we need to suppress the virus and we need to accelerate the vaccination programme. So it's not one or the other. Scotland is currently emerging from its second national lockdown. In England, they are emerging from their third national lockdown. And last summer, there was quite a lot of criticism about the cautious approach as we emerged um, from lockdown, lockdown in early summer. But actually, that allowed the us to keep suppress the virus for longer. And we didn't need to go into a national lockdown in November as they did uh, elsewhere in the UK. So there is a benefit, there's an economic benefit from that uh, cautious approach and making sure that we suppress the virus. But the second part to the question is, of course, the need to provide financial support. This month, businesses, small businesses, most small businesses will receive uh, financial support. They'll receive a restart grant. Now, those restart grants are equivalent to uh, a one-off restart grant of between £8,000 and £18,000, alongside the equivalent of two months of the Strategic Framework Business Fund. So for some businesses, they will get up to about £19,500 um, uh, to help with the immediate uh, costs of reopening in terms of restocking um, or taking um, staff off furlough. So I suppose that's the answer to that first question. How will you help small businesses? Well, first, suppress the virus so that we can get the businesses open and trading as quickly as possible. And secondly, providing that financial support. Now, I know that there are businesses that haven't received the, the level of financial support that they might need. And that's why local authorities have the discretionary fund. That discretionary fund is designed to help businesses that haven't received uh, normal funding, um, uh, uh, particularly in Bade Knock and Strath's Bay. I can think of uh, laundrettes um, or uh, dog groomers or dog walkers um, and other businesses that don't fit neatly into the retail hospitality or the leisure sector. So that was um, question number one. Uh, we've got another question here on um, duelling from Perth to Inverness and a question about delays to the duelling programme and what progress is being made. Well, the first, as uh, two points to as I, before I, I get into the detail. Firstly, the A9 and duelling the A9 is in the manifesto. 
So you can see it in black and white in the manifesto today. Um, it is um, a commitment that is there. And of course, um, secondly, it's a commitment that's been long time, a long time coming for uh, the many generations that have uh, grown up in the Highlands and Islands. They will know how hugely important uh, the A9 is, uh, how dangerous a road it is, and how vital it is that it is jewelled. So that commitment remains. In terms of progress, um, progress is being made. There is a, a, a link um, online, which I am happy to post on the, the, the Facebook group later on, which details um, the progress being made on each phase. So uh, just a number of weeks ago, um, three further phases, the orders for three further phases were laid. That follows extensive consultation with local communities, uh, particularly when it affects uh, local uh, landlords' land and when there is some conflict around uh, uh, where the A9 should go and the duelling should go. But we are committed. There are updates regularly posted on uh, the link um, online that can show uh, what progress uh, is being made. Another question um, here about a different form of connectivity, and it is a uh, broadband. Um, those that have been affected by a uh, broadband and uh, who have been working from home um, and have not been able to receive super fast broadband and how that aligns with um, our commitment to uh, ensuring that every property has access to broadband, the R100 uh, programme. Uh, um, I feel your pain. Uh, I have had um, some uh, broadband issues myself over the last few weeks, which is hugely frustrating. Um, not that long ago, I was, uh, well, just a few weeks ago, I was giving a speech not too dissimilar like to this, um, and unbeknownst to me, uh, the broadband failed um, just a matter of, of minutes into my speech. Um, and I see uh, uh, something being flagged just now in terms of my connection being unstable. So I feel your pain. The short answer in terms of broadband and mobile connectivity is that uh, the commitment on broadband, which was to ensure that every uh, property, whether it was business or residential, had access to super fast broadband, um, was derailed. It was derailed by a legal uh, action taken by uh, one of the bidders in the tender process um, against um, the, one of the other bidders. So that has um, unfortunately delayed the R100 programme. However, in light of the fact that our commitment was that people would still have broadband, a voucher scheme has been put in place. And there are two vouchers available, vouchers which are um, significantly more generous for people who um, are unlikely to get a particular, um, to, to be part of the, 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 the R100 um, the immediate programme, um, and vouchers for those who want to get broadband by the end of this year um, and don't want to wait for the R100 programme. So those vouchers are available. But the R100 uh, programme is now uh, back on track. It has been delayed. It is back on track to ensure that every proper band. That goes hand in hand with the commitment um, to uh, ensure that there's mobile connectivity as well and to ensure that um, uh, with when it comes to mobile connectivity, that in areas which we would call uh, not spots, um, in not spots, uh, parts of the, the constituency which don't have access to mobile connectivity. The Scottish Government is investing in um, their own uh, mobile phone masts in order to uh, parts of the Highlands in particular to mobile connectivity that don't, um, that don't have it right now. Another question coming in around Cairngorm Mountain. And a, a question at about um, what um, the future holds um, with Cairngorm Mountain and um, community involvement. Um, so I, I know that there are, are lots of uh, different um, conflicting sometimes um, views about the future of Cairngorm Mountain, whether that's to do with planning applications, whether that's the community involvement, 
or whether that's the way in which um, the mountain has been managed over the last uh, few years. During the winter, of course, uh, Cairngorm Mountain is absolutely essential to the local economy. Now, there's um, a, a very um, strong um, and resilient uh, local economy, but we know that um, when there is a, a, a strong um, a customer base coming to the mountain, then it's good for local businesses as well. So the, the Scottish government has uh, invested in repairing the funicular, uh, looking at uh, the figures. It was going to cost um, substantial funds to remove the funicular um, or uh, we could um, repair it and um, better to repair it than to uh, remove it um, on a financial basis um, and replace it with something else. So we have um, chosen to uh, replace it, um, to uh, uh, invest in that in order to um, get it back open um, and running. Um, obviously this, some, this winter was unfortunate due to COVID, um, not least because we had some very good snowfall, um, but the hope is that that investment in Cairngorm Mountain, which I know is a point of dispute and concern from other ski resorts who um, argue that they too should receive um, a, a similar level of investment. But that, uh, that investment has been agreed and that investment will be made um, in, in the mountain to, to ensure that it continues to attract skiers um, because some of the rumours over the last few years that were spread far and wide meant that uh, some people thought that it was closed. So getting the mountain open and um, ensuring that it's a, an attractive place to, to ski in Scotland um, is important. Okay, there are a few more questions in, in economy and infrastructure which we could maybe come back to, but I'm keen that we move on to other um, uh, sections. So um, tourism. Um, over uh, lockdown, there have been excessive noise. Um, at, before, sorry, before lockdown, there was ex, at times excessive noise at the weekends um, from um, a local uh, accommodation in in, in Bidnoch. and so has been a prob It's been a problem in more residential areas of Bidnoch. How um, do you ensure that you encourage more responsible tourism? Well, thanks. It's a good question because what I don't want to do in this answer is to in any way denigrate or to undermine the very responsible accommodation providers in Badenoch and Strathspey or the responsible tourists who um, come, respect the environment, respect the local community and leave no trace behind. But this is a, an issue not just in Badenoch and Strathspey, but it's also been an issue in parts of Edinburgh as well when it comes to some more antisocial behaviour. And that's why the Scottish Government introduced uh, just a few uh, weeks ago the um, a, a, a piece of legislation um, that allowed local authorities to implement um, control zones. So where there were... Um, higher numbers or disproportionately higher numbers of a uh, um, short-term lets and um, a local authority could do something about that that had another piece of legislation alongside it which wasn't introduced and um, because um, we withdrew it in order to consult more with the um, with stakeholders and the second piece of legislation was about uh, implementing a standardized health and safety uh, regulation um, across um, short-term lets in Scotland and as part of that local authorities would be allowed to take more action on things like antisocial behaviour. So that piece of, second piece of legislation we withdrew um, and committed to working with uh, people like groups like the Association of Scottish Self-Caterers to review um, the, how we could make sure it worked both for um, accommodation providers as well as the wider local community. So right now, of course, um, there are uh, powers already. The police have powers, local authorities have powers when it comes to um, antisocial behaviour or excessive antisocial behaviour um, that can uh, be used. 
It does sit alongside a much bigger, broader conversation, of course, about responsible tourism, which is an issue um, that is not just relevant to accommodation, but also relevant when it comes to to, to campers, um, particularly dirty campers. And that leads quite neatly into another question that's come through um, around uh, what um, what is being done to crack down on dirty camping and uh, things like the mess that were that were um, that were made, the messes that were made, the mess that was made around Loch Morley uh, last year. And I suppose um, a number of points there in when it comes to dirty camping. That firstly, there's a lot been a lot of work over the winter period to try and prepare for what will probably be another very busy summer in the Highlands and Islands as people can't go on their international holidays and so they will choose um, to do a staycation. Um, So there has been a lot of work over that period, over the winter period, um, with Visit Scotland, Scottish Government and local authorities in the National Park working together to prepare for uh, this season. Um, That includes um, the highlight includes recruiting more reason re, um, includes um, recruiting more seasonal rangers, um, so that there's individuals there in person to try and regulate behaviour. It also includes significantly more investment in rural tourism, in rural tourism infrastructure to try and uh, ensure that there is adequate infrastructure there for visitors who come in terms of uh, uh, toilets in terms of um, camping facilities, um, which I know is a, is a particularly important issue um, near Loch Morley. So there has been a lot of work um, over the last uh, few months and Visit Scotland have uh, launched a very substantial um, visitor management uh, campaign to remind people um, more irresponsible campers um, from elsewhere in Scotland um, what um, obligations and responsibilities they face when it comes to camping. Okay, another question here. Um, and remember, if you've got any uh, questions or, or comments, just uh, fire a comment or a question into the Facebook live, the Facebook event. Next question here is around affordable housing in Badenoch, which is linked probably to the next question around second homes. And actually it's probably linked to the next, the third question here, which is around um, uh, encouraging young people to stay in the area or attracting more young people to move to the area when they can't find anywhere to stay. Affordable housing. I think uh, in Badenoch in particular, affordable housing is a, a huge issue and partly due to the attractiveness of the National Park um, and, and partly due to some of the challenges in, in, in building homes. We have announced today that over and above the 97,000 uh, affordable homes that the SNP have delivered since 2007, that we will build or we will deliver another 100,000 over the next 10 years. And I am absolutely determined that some of those new affordable homes are in the National Park area in Badenoch and Straths Bay. Uh, those affordable homes need to cater for a whole host of different buyers. So they need to include uh, homes for social rent, but they also need to include homes for those that can afford um, to uh, buy a property, um, but need a bit of help. So shared equity schemes um, and other schemes um, that are available. Um, so it needs to be a, a mixed tenure of uh, housing partic- and, and, and mixed sizes as well for those that are already on the property ladder perhaps of a rural burden that limits the sale of that property uh, on the open market or limits the sale of the property to somebody who doesn't live and work in the area and I think we need to see more affordable homes with that rural burden on it. 
The third element is trying to do more to disincentivize, uh, to try and dis- try and disincentivize um, the uh, the the sale of homes as second homes. So. A few years ago, the additional dwelling supplement was introduced. That is a surcharge on the purchase of a second home. Um, I think that needs to be reviewed to check that it is as effective as possible. That would be the third thing. So uh, building more homes, uh, uh, disincentivizing second homes, putting on more of a rural burden. Um, And then the fourth element to this is making sure that there are jobs alongside the homes and making sure that... uh, you know, right now, there's too big a gap between the the high prices and the average income um, or the average wages of jobs in the Highlands. And that gap is too big. Um, and so we need to ensure that there are um, adequate, good jobs. Um, and one of the other elements that was announced uh, today as part of the manifesto is the Rural Entrepreneur Fund to support uh, rural entrepreneurs to either move here or with their own um, a, a, with with a new business so those are four um, elements to that um, but there's probably more that can be said that's very specific to Badenoch when it comes to making sure that uh, regulations and rules are not standing in the way are not the the red tape that prohibit the delivery of accommodation and housing and instead it should be designed to enable accommodation and housing because you do not have a tourism industry unless you have a a workforce and you can't have a workforce unless you have accommodation. Okay moving on to a a, a new section Um, there's only two sections left you'll be uh, glad to know. Um, We've done economy, tourism, housing, health um so a question about uh care provision and um uh, patients being kept longer in hospital because of a lack of available social care um and how do you ensure that there is adequate um care at home um to reduce um delayed uh, discharges it's a really really important question that's been brought to the fore uh, through covid because um, for for years there's been criticisms and and, uh, questions around delayed discharges of patients who could go home, but there isn't a care package there for them at home. And at the beginning of the pandemic, that is one of the biggest reasons why patients were uh, discharged in such great numbers to care homes. It was to try and get them somewhere safer, out of hospital, um, and um, a huge amount of work went in to to ensure that those care packages were in place. And so it takes money, it takes effort to make sure those care packages are in place. But the root of the problem is the way that our care system operates. So on one hand, we have a national health service where your health uh, care is free at the point of need and um, it's not dependent on the means of payment and the means of uh, paying. That is not true of our care system. And one of uh, the biggest things emerging, I think, from the pandemic is the need to look again at how our care uh, is is delivered. And one of the the commitments that we have made is to establish a new national care service. So that will uh, include abolishing uh, non-residential social care charges and will also include um, looking after our care staff uh, better as well. But that, I think, ensuring that our care service works seamlessly with our National Health Service is one of the biggest uh, answers um, to that question, to make sure that it is not, that people are not stuck in hospital waiting to be able to pay for their care but actually we have a care service that works uh, seamlessly. Now that is a a longer term or at least a medium term objective. In the meantime, uh, any issues that are brought to my attention, I'm very happy to work on um, as if we elected as as local MSP to make sure that we, um, to make sure that we do 
uh, have that uh, seamless um, uh, approach to care and patients are not stuck in hospital longer than they need to be. Okay, um, another question, um, you'll be pleased to know this is the this is the second last question. Um, so this week, um, the Greens pledged access to counselling for young people in schools. Um, there's a, a mental health crisis after, uh, particularly after the pandemic. Uh, uh, what are we doing to tackle that um, health crisis for young people? Well, I think that that question is uh, spot on because um, there is um, a, a huge uh, crisis right now. And over the last uh, few years, we've seen some real progress when it comes to investing in our, our mental health. Uh, we saw the first uh, Minister for Mental Health um, and we've also seen the first um, substantial uh, increase in investment, £1.2 billion being spent. Uh, this year in mental health. Um, one of the commitments in the manifesto is that we will increase the direct investment into mental health services by at least 25% and ensure that by the end of the next parliament, um, at least um, uh, 1% um, is for CAMS, for children and adolescent uh, mental health uh, services. So the, the financial investment has significantly increased uh, year on year. But alongside that, it's making sure that mental health provision is there where and when people need it. And that's where rolling out uh, counsellors in schools over the last few years, which was a commitment we made a number of years ago, has been so important. So there has been uh, funding given to Highland Council to ensure that there is uh, that our counsellors um, in schools so that young people can access that counselling service in schools um, as well. Because um, often it's the, it's the bravery required to uh, go looking for help that is most important. And the easier that help is to find, the more accessible it is, um, the better. And then alongside that, the, the more destigmatized it is, uh, the better as well. Okay, here's a, a slight, a, no less important, but um, a slightly more random one on fly tipping. Um, fly tipping, and it's a growing problem. I think littering generally seems to be a, a growing problem. Uh, if you've driven uh, down any of our main roads uh, recently with laybys uh, full of uh, rubbish and uh, the the side of the roads um, full of rubbish um, and a lot of issues with with fly tipping uh, as well. Um, the, it is a, a huge uh, huge issue. Um, I think particularly um, over the last uh, few years. I don't know if it's linked with the new um, charges for the brown bins. I don't know because uh, I never understand why people are able to go to such lengths of disrespecting um, passers-by and, and the natural environment by choosing to tip out their, their rubbish uh, for somebody else to, 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 to deal with um, and to pick up. Um, there are responsibilities, there are um, responsibilities on, uh, on um, uh, SIPA um, and on the local authority when it comes to uh, litter and there are uh, fines in place uh, to, to deal with fly tipping but of course those type fines only apply when somebody is caught uh, fly tipping um, rather than when it's left so if people are caught then there are penalties for fly tipping if they're not caught then it's at the taxpayer's expense that, that fly tipping um, will be uh, resolved but I am uh, very supportive of any efforts and any measures to uh, catch people or to increase the efforts to catch those fly tipping in the first place and apparently so the questioner says that there are um there are new ways um of trying to catch fly tippers by working collaboratively with farmers 
uh, which is something that I'd uh, be very supportive of. Uh, and there's probably a number of other uh, groups that you could work um, collaboratively with, uh, not just farmers, um, to try and catch those fly tipping in the first place. And obviously, alongside that, um, raising awareness and campaigning, there was quite a lot of work done by SEPA um, in the last few years to try and raise awareness that fly tipping was uh, wrong. Um, I'm never quite sure why people uh, need it uh, reminded that it is wrong because quite blatantly and quite clearly it is not acceptable to be chucking um, all your big rubbish um, into uh, an area of, of natural beauty or the natural environment and uh, it needs to be um, it needs to be resolved but the more we can do to catch them in the first place then uh, the more penalties that can be issued and hopefully it puts more people off uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to um, fly tipping in the first place. Well, that is all of our uh, questions that have been um, submitted uh, in advance. So hopefully if you did um, submit a question, you have received an answer. And if you're not happy with the answer, then my inbox is always open to emails. It's uh, info at kate-forbes.scot and I will happily uh, reply or pick up on any issues. Um, if any of you have a postal vote, my postal vote came uh, today um, and hopefully um, what you've seen in the, the SNP's uh, manifesto, an ambitious, optimistic uh, manifesto for the future has inspired you to use both your votes uh, for the SNP. But if you are, are still to vote in the next few weeks and you've got any comments or questions, then please uh, get in touch. And that brings us quite neatly to the end of this virtual public meeting, which um, is not um, is far from normal. <laughs> far from normal. I can think of a, a, a number of uh, campaign events, particularly in uh, King Craig um, Hall. I'm not sure why it was always in King Craig, but uh, a lot of good events in King Craig, uh, taking questions and answering questions um, from uh, the audience. So this is a slightly different way slightly less interactive, um, although there are opportunities to, to post questions and comments. Um, but thank you very much for those questions. And there's still a little bit of daylight uh, and a little bit of sunshine uh, to enjoy in this April evening. So thanks very much. And uh, hopefully see some of you again on the virtual campaign trail. Bye.